Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking uh, the elders for, for asking me to do this. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak in front of the church and bring a, a lesson to y'all. Um, I'll be honest, I don't know how long this will go, because the last time I taught a variation of this one was in Germany, and the church we were teaching with there uh, had mostly uh, Ghanaian brethren, so all our... Um, all our sermons that we taught had to be translated, so there was like a back and forth and awkward pauses on my part while I waited for the translation. And uh, so I really have no idea about the timing. I don't think it'll be terribly long, uh, but uh, I've added some things and, and taken some things away, so I really have no idea. Uh, so I'll, I'll open by saying that uh, I want to thank uh, Brother Landon for, for reading that scripture, uh, Proverbs uh, thirteen, verse twenty: "He who walks the rise grows wise, but the pain of fools suffers harm." Um, I think that's a very important scripture uh, for us to, to keep in mind uh, in daily living and, and within the church. Um, and the, I titled this lesson, The Company We Keep, um, and it's, it's going to be a, a look at the, the life of King David and uh, Joab, which if you've read the book of Second Samuels, then, then you know a lot about these two characters. Uh, most of us are probably a lot more familiar with King David. Um, and uh, I, over the past couple of years, I've been reading through the, the entire Bible from start to finish with my children every night. We read about a chapter or so every night. Uh, so it's taken a while to get through, but it's been a very good practice for them. And while I had known about King David and I'd known of Joab before, as I was reading through the book of Second Samuels, there's a lot that struck me about their relationship that kind of inspired this lesson. Um, so... Getting into it, uh, so before I get into the, the heart of the lesson, I just wanted to bring us back to our, our theme here, and that's uh, for the year. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 18, then they said, let us arise and build, so they put their hand to the good work. And I think in many regards that applies to how we are trying to build ourselves as a church here locally at, at Mill Road. Um, and if we aspire to arise and build a stronger local church here for the Lord, we must be willing to work on our personal relationships. I think the foundation of, of the Lord's church uh, is clearly Christ, his son. The, um, but what he has given us here in the local church will only grow stronger based on the, the strength of our individual relationships with each other as Christians. Um, obviously, our faith in God is a huge part in that, and that's something that we have in common. And I think um, you can tell when a church is close, when the members of the church are close. As somebody who's traveled a lot from the military and moved around a lot, uh, lost track of the number of churches I've been a member of, but I'll tell you that the nice thing, even though we've only gotten to spend a couple of years at each location, is there are many places around the world that I could go, and particularly here in the United States, and I know that there's a warm bed waiting for me if I call up a friend and, and ask if, if I can stay. Uh, and that's, that isn't from Army friends, that's from the churches that we've been a part of, and knowing that we have that, that love and that common bond. Now, the Bible is quite clear about the importance of relationships, as we read, uh, and who we choose to associate ourselves with is an incredibly important matter with, with incredibly profound consequences. Um, we can see here, King Solomon wrote, he who walks the wise grows wise, he, the companion of fools suffers harm. So, it's important to, to think about who we choose to associate with because that can have eternal consequences if we are not careful to guard our own hearts or to grow our own hearts through those that we associate with. Now, Ezekiel, uh, and I apologize how small these, uh, I tried to put a lot of the scriptures on here, but I'm assuming people in the back are having a hard time reading. But Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20 says, The man who sins will die. The righteousness of the righteous will be upon himself. The wickedness of the wicked will be upon himself. Romans chapter 2, verse 5 through 8. But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath, and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each person according to his deeds. To those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life, but to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath, and indignation. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. I think what's clear across all these scriptures, and there are more, 
that each of us are held individually accountable. That's an important principle to remember. While our, our associations will not be judged on their actions, their actions can either make our lives as Christians much easier or much more difficult. In King David, it's easy to, I think, overlook a lot of the problematic times of David's life because even though we know he's far from perfect, we have these scriptures here like 1 Samuel 13, 14 that say the Lord has sought out for himself a man after his own heart. The Lord has appointed him as a ruler over his people. And in Acts chapter 13, 22, scripture makes it clear that that phrase was said about David. David was raised up to be their king, concerning whom he also testified and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, whom will do all my will. And I think those are the scriptures we tend to remember about King David, even before he was king. Um, and it can make it easy for us to overlook some of the more problematic things that happened in David's life. But when we stop and take a look at the book of 2 Samuel, and we look at all the problematic things that happened in David's life and all the, the wrongdoings that he committed or the, the sin that so easily entangled him, there's one common denominator in just about every one of those circumstances, and that's this man, Joab. So who was Joab? Joab, according to 1 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 13 and 16, Jesse became the father of David. David was his seventh son, and his sisters were Zeruiah and Abigail. And the three sons of Zeruiah were Abshai, Joab, and Asahel. So, Joab was one of David's nephews. But perhaps more important and more profound in the relationship was we see in 2 Samuel chapter 8, verse 15 and 16, David appointed Joab as the ruler over, over his army. He was at the top general in David's army. So they had a very close relationship. King to his, the top general of his army. And as well tied by that family relation. But when we start looking at pretty early on in uh, David's rule, 2 Samuel chapter 2, verse 18 to 23, we see how Abner was uh, Saul's top, uh, top general. So when the country was divided between some going for David and some going for, for Saul and wanting Saul's family to continue the line, Abner was a... Uh, was the leader of the other, basically the, the other half of, of uh, the fight, wanting, the, wanting Saul's line to, to continue. And, uh, sorry, I lost my thoughts. Uh, so what we see in chapter 2 of 2 Samuel is that Abner is on the run from, from David's army after a, a small battle. And Abner's brother, Asahel, I think that the Bible describes him as being as fleet-footed as a gazelle. So he's a very fast runner. He's chasing down Abner. And Abner calls back and says, uh, some of the effect of, hey, leave me alone. Like, I don't want to have to kill you. And Asahel continues to chase him. I think he gives him a second warning. And then eventually it, it, it says, it's a pretty violent text, it, it talks about how uh, Abner takes a spear and thrusts it behind him, and it goes completely through Asahel's stomach. Pierces out the other side. He kills him. Uh, now, this was an act of self-defense, and David forgives him for it, and, and he actually tries to make peace with Abner and says, hey, Abner, come over. Please, let's unite the kingdom. Let, let's all try and serve God together. Well, uh, Joab was the older brother of Abner, or sorry, of Asahel, and did not take too kindly. He, he did not understand why David would forgive the man that killed his brother. So in a, uh, an act of deceit, when Abner comes back to, uh, to Jerusalem, Joab pulls him aside and murders him. Says it, it's done right there at the city gates. Uh, and uh, David, also not happy about this. And in fact, right at the beginning of David's rule, he starts off and, and says, Afterward, when David heard it, he said, I and my kingdom are innocent before the Lord forever of the blood of Abner, the son of Ner. May it fall on the head of Joab and on all his father's house. And may there not fall, not fail from the house of Joab, one who has a discharge, or who is a leper, or who takes hold of a distaff, or who falls by the sword, or who lacks bread. So Joab and Abishai, his brother, killed Abner because he had put their brother Asahel to death in the battle at Gibeon. So David actually curses Joab. 
It doesn't go so far as to actually remove Joab from his life. It doesn't remove him from his generalship. He keeps him around. Even after cursing him and saying, I, I hope he has trouble all his life and all his family as well because of this act. Uh, and I think it's important to draw a distinction here. Some might say that perhaps this is justified revenge on, on Joab's part, but that's not the case. I think it's pretty obvious here, actually, if you read back in verse 30, that the way the Lord looked at it, Abner killed their brother Asahel in self-defense, it says, in battle, in, the death, in death at battle at Gibeon. What Joab did to Abner was deceive him, pull him aside, and then murder him. There's a difference there, that's a distinction that's being drawn. Well, in both cases, somebody ended up dead, and that's tragic. Uh, one was, was justified in one regard, and the other was clearly not. And I think this is where we really see Joab starting to show his true colors for the, the kind of man that he was and the, the kind of, I dare say, leader that he was. When you move along to the next phase in, in David's life where he experienced some issues, is was moving of the ark. And it, he starts off this, this is only a, a couple chapters later in chapter 6, by, now David gather, again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. That's his army. Who was his general? Joab. So Joab was clearly a part of this. And David rose and went with all the people who were with him, Baal, uh, Baal Judah, to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name, the very name of the Lord of the hosts, who is enthroned above the cherubim. They placed the ark of God on a new cart that they, had, that they might bring it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, and Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were leading the new cart. They brought it with the ark of God from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, and Ahio was walking ahead of the ark. Meanwhile, David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with all kinds of instruments, made of fir, wood, and with lyres, harps and tambourines, castanets and cymbals. But when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out toward the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen nearly upset it. The anger of the Lord burned against Uzzah, and God struck him down for his irreverence. He died there by the ark of God. David became angry because of the Lord's outburst against Uzzah, and that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. I think what's important here is that the Israelites knew how to move God's ark. There's no question. They were, this is a day where oral histories were a big thing, and guess what? They carried the ark properly from the wilderness into Israel, crossing the Jordan, the Levitical priests holding it on their shoulders. Everybody knew this story. Everybody knew how the ark was supposed to be transported. Clearly, on an ox cart was not the right answer. And Uzzah, sorry, yeah, Uzzah, I think, yeah, he made a mistake. I mean, clearly, he paid for that mistake. I think he was trying to, to ensure that God's ark did not fall and hit the ground. He was in violation of God's law to begin with, and all this is David's fault. David made this choice, and Joab had a part in it, and not being a good advisor, but arguably the general was probably the top advisor to the king in most matters, especially ones that involved his army being moved around. Um, there's no way that neither Uzzah or David has a valid excuse for not knowing what was, what was right in the circle. And Uzzah, sorry, Uzzah, Joab failed to properly advise David. Again, we all know the story of David and Bathsheba. Moving on to 2 Samuel chapter 11. David commits his sin with, with Bathsheba. And we'll get through the pretext on that. But then he tries to cover it up by bringing Uriah in. Now, Uriah was out at war with Joab, the general. And David sends a note to Joab saying, hey, send me back Uriah. Well, this is kind of an odd request. Right. Joab doesn't question it. He just sends back Uriah, does what the king says. But there's... There's no question as to, to why are you asking for this man back. Uh, and when David fails to actually cover up his own sin the way he initially intended to with Uriah, Uriah uh, he directs Joab to arrange for Uriah's death in battle. He tries to commit murder by proxy. Uh, and again, Joab has no compulsion or no compunction about, about being complicit in this. He, he easily agrees to play his part. Uh, he puts Uriah right at the, the front lines. Now, he doesn't do it exactly the way David said. David said, put him at the front lines where the, the battle will be fiercest, and then have all your other men draw back, that he will be struck down dead. Um, instead, 
won't belabor this point, but instead Joab actually sends his, his people up against the wall, and many of them are killed, uh, Uriah being among them. Um, the unfortunate thing is Uriah is the only one we know about by name that, that dies in this, but it sounds like there were actually multiple others of David's mighty men that are killed as a result of this cover-up of one person. Um, and we, we see in the end there that it says that when the time of warning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife, and she bore him a son. The thing that David had done was evil in the sight of the Lord. So David sinned of his own accord. Joab had nothing to do with the initial sin. He attempted to help the initial cover-up, and then he ultimately ensured that Uriah was murdered um, to, to ensure that David got his way, uh, at least in this one small part, in covering up his own sin so that the people wouldn't know, so that he wouldn't be embarrassed, so that David wouldn't be inconvenienced. And it's really a, a sad story. Um, it's actually even, maybe from a human perspective, a little more dramatic and a little more sad is that David actually made Uriah carry a sealed envelope with his own death orders written on it back to, to Joab. When Joab opened that letter, he, he knew exactly what happened. He knew the betrayal of David against, against Uriah. Uh, and I can't imagine many other reasons. I think, although we don't know what the contents of the letter were beyond make sure that this guy dies, uh, and, and in this way, uh, we don't know that David confessed his sin to, to Joab in any way, but... There aren't too many other reasons why David would have done this, right? I think, the, I think Joab probably knew what was going on. That's perhaps a guess, but Joab was aware and did not advise, once again, his king against, against this terrible course of action. He didn't take seriously the, the service that David was supposed to be doing to God first. Second Samuel chapter 13 chapter 18, we won't read it all, but we see the, the story of Absalom, David's, one of David's older sons, um, and how it starts in chapter 13 with Amnon and Tamer, two other children of David, uh, and a, a very terrible circumstance there in which Amnon takes a, his uh, sister forcibly. And as a result, Absalom uh, has murders Amnon, his other brother. Uh, I think there's some half relationships in here because David had multiple wives. Um, but I think what's clear is that David's children did not have a great influence beyond him in life. And, and one of those reasons is because of Joab being kept around. And we don't see a direct relationship between Joab and all of David's children. But the top general in, in David's army, his top advisor, probably around the palace whenever he's not out at war, um, the children see that. They see the kind of man that David's tolerating in his life and around his family. And there's an influence there. There's, there's no, no question in my mind that a lot of this trouble that David has with his children is probably a result of what he tolerated in, in the, the man that he kept around his family and kept around his kingdom and kept around as a leader. Not just, not just tolerated to, to live and be in the kingdom, but actually had continued to prop him up and keep him as, a, and as an example to the people of, this is the kind of warrior I want. Whether or not he actually said those words, his actions spoke loud enough that people knew that Joab and his behavior was, in some regard, acceptable to David. That's a, that's a sad statement. Um, and when Absalom runs away after, after murdering his brother uh, Amon, um, Amnon, rather, because he's afraid of his, his father, the king, and that he will come back and, and take revenge against his Against Amnon, uh, sorry, against Absalom for the killing of Amnon. These names are so similar, I apologize. Uh, he runs away, and then Joab arranges for him to come back. So Joab, or Amnon, or Absalom comes back, and then he, David says, oh, I don't want to see you. Go to your farm. Uh, never, never sees his face. Joab is the one that arranged for him to come back, so Absalom starts pestering Joab, saying, hey, like, can you arrange for an audience for me with the king? And Joab ignores him. Twice, I think it says, and then Absalom actually lights, field, lights fire to, to Joab's fields to, to make him angry. Uh, so then Joab eventually arranges for that um, face-to-face -face between Absalom and, and King David. Um, then Absalom, I think, in his bitterness about how all this happened, about how he was called back and then not given an audience to the king for so long, and then being ignored as well by the general, who had the placement and access to arrange for it, uh, 
he decides, you know what, I can do a better job than those two. And he starts arranging this conspiracy, and he, he starts intercepting all these people that would come to the king and bring their pleas before the king, and tries to provide justice on his own regard, and under his own name as, as a son of the king, and tries to prop himself up, and eventually does actually launch a successful coup in, in some regards. He moves to, to Hebron, which was, if you look back, was the initial city where, where David ruled from in Israel before he took Jerusalem, uh, and he, he announces himself as king. And then for several chapters, we see David is on the run um, from his son Absalom and, and from his army. And eventually, uh, Joab starts winning some battles for David. And, and then in a counter-revolution, is able to place, his, uh, place David back on the throne. Now, when David's coming back to his position of power, he tells Joab and uh, the two other generals that he had, it says in front of all the people, he tells them, everybody knew, Preserve the life of my son Absalom. You're going to go hunt him down, but I want him brought back to me alive. It says, The king charged Joab and Abishai and Nittai, saying, Deal gently for my sake with the young men Absalom. And all the people heard when the king charged all the commanders concerning him. The people went out into, sorry, this is uh, 2 Samuel chapter 18, verse 6. Then the people went out into the field against Israel, and the battle took place in the forest of Ephraim. The people of Israel were defeated there for the servants of David. And the slaughter there that day was great, 20,000 men. For the battle there was spread over the whole countryside, and the forest devoured more people that day than the sword devoured. Now Absalom happened to meet the servants of David, for Absalom was riding on his mule, and the mule went under the thick branches of a great oak. His head caught fast in the oak, so that he was left hanging between heaven and earth, while the mule that was under him kept going. When a certain man saw it, he told Joab, and said, Behold, I saw Absalom hanging in an oak. Joab said to the man who had told him, Now behold, you saw him. Why then did you not strike him there to the ground? I would have given you ten pieces of silver and a belt. And said to Joab, Even if I should receive a thousand pieces of silver in my hand, I would not put out my hand against the king's son. For in our hearing, the king charged you and Abishai and Ittai, saying, Protect for me the young man Absalom. Otherwise, if I had dealt treacherously against his life, and there is nothing hidden from the king, then you yourself would have stood aloof. And Joab said, I will not waste time here with you. So he took three spears in his hand and thrust them through the heart of Absalom while he was yet alive in the midst of the oak. Ten young men who carried Joab's armor gathered around and struck Absalom and killed him. So yet again, another example of Joab committing murder, and this time it's the king's own son. And ex again, expressly against David's will and David's command. And everybody heard it. And we can see the influence of Joab, because it says the ten young men who carried his armor joined in on it. They were like, oh, well, I guess this is cool. This is what we're doing now. Uh, and they contributed to the murder of Absalom. You know, and actually, before I move on, I think it's also important to note that the Joab's sin and his lies beget more of it. If you read the rest of the story, and there's a, not a terribly long chapter, um, but we see that Joab instructs uh, the messenger to, to lie to David about how Absalom died, or at least deceive and, and leave out key details like I'm the one that murdered him, uh, kind of a key detail there. Uh, and then there's another man, Ahimaaz, the, the son of Zadok, who, who asked to, to run and bring the message. Uh, and he says, no, you shouldn't be the one. Perhaps he didn't trust that guy to partake in the deceit. Um, but Ahimaaz actually overtakes the Cushite, who, who observed the death uh, and was sent as the initial messenger and gets David first. And uh, he does actually participate in the deceit. Both these men, both messengers, knew what actually happened, and neither one specifically ever said, Joab is the one that ordered, ordered your son's death. Uh, they, they let David assume that Absalom died in the course of battle, not as a matter of murder. Um, and it, again, it's really sad that this influence that Joab has over the army and over the people uh, leads to all these other sins happening. And as a result, Joab gets off from this. He, uh, there's no consequence. And in fact, when we see later when David's recounting about all the terrible things that Joab did, it does, David doesn't mention that Absalom was murdered by him. He mentions Amasa, who we're about to talk about in a few minutes, and, uh, and Abner, but he doesn't even mention his own son. And you'd think that if David knew about this when he's retelling the story to Solomon about how terrible Joab is, that his own son would have come up. 
but he doesn't. So I think this deceit carries through the rest of David's life. Um, so Amasa was, uh, was Absalom's top general. So once again, just like with Abner, David, in the attempt to, to reunify the kingdom after being split, he says to, to Amasa, May God do so to me, and more also, if you will not be commander of the army before me continually in place of Joab. So this is the one time that, that David attempts to, to replace Joab, and maybe as an attempt to cut him and his poor influence out of his life uh, by replacing him with Amasa. But I think this is also an olive branch that he was extending to the other side of the kingdom that had revolted against him. He's trying to bring everybody back and reunify the kingdom under, under his rule for, for God's sake and for the people of God to be uni unified and united. And uh, we see here, in just one chapter later, Joab is not a man who's going to suffer this lightly. He's been displaced. He doesn't like it. He doesn't like not being the, the top general. Maybe he's number two or three now. Uh, we don't get the details on just how far down the the rung ladders he fell. Uh, but when we see in, in 2 Samuel chapter 20, verse 9, Joab said to Amasa, Is it well with you, my brother? And Joab took Amasa by the beard with his right hand to kiss him. And actually, before I move on, it's, it's important to note that uh, Amasa was another nephew of David. So this was one of Joab's cousins. Uh, but Amasa was not on guard against the sword which was in Joab's hand. So he struck him in the belly with it and poured out his inward parts on the ground and did not strike him again, and he died. And Joab and Abishai, his brother, pursued Sheba, the son of Betri. Now there stood by him one of Joab's young men, and said, Whoever favors Joab and whoever is for David, let him follow Joab. But Amasa lay wallowing in his blood in the middle of the highway. And when the men saw that all the people stood still, when the man saw that all the people stood still, he removed Amasa from the highway into the field and threw a garment over him. When he saw that everyone who came by him stood still. So everybody saw it. We saw what Joab just did. He had another act of murder. A man who's he's not afraid to get his hands dirty to get what he wants. And it says right here that the, the men who stood by him, Joab's young men, immediately propped him back up as the general. I mean, this didn't go back to David for decision. Joab was just the general again because the guy who had supplanted him was now dead and murdered by his own hand. Another circumstance in which David gets himself in some trouble is the census. This is near the end of David's rule. It's the, the last chapter of, of 2 Samuel, uh, chapter 24. David's upset with the Lord, and it says, and he, he says, Now again, the anger of the Lord burned against Israel, and it incited David against them to say, Go number Israel and Judah. David's up, Lord's upset with Israel. David's upset with the Lord. David acts rashly and says, You know what? Pretty strong on my own, but I want to know just how strong I am. Go, go tell me how many people are, are out there. And, and to his credit, Joab does actually attempt to initially advise against this and say, King said to Joab, the commander of the army was with him, Go about now through all the tribes of Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, and register the people, that I may know the number of the people. But Joab said to the king, And may the Lord your God add to the people a hundred times as many as there are, while the eyes of my lord the king still see. But why does my lord the king delight in this? So what's, what's interesting to me, so I will give Joab a little bit of credit here. He does try and pers lightly persuade David otherwise. Says, but he doesn't use a particularly convincing argument, and David pursues this and, and goes ahead and, and wants to, to commit the sin of hubris. Um, but what's interesting to me is Joab's argument against it isn't about necessarily the, or, or, or at least he doesn't argue it very effectively that this will anger the Lord even further, or why are you doing this? This is like just a, a matter of your pride. This is silly. You're sending your army out to do something that's a waste of our time. Uh, he doesn't, and will anger the Lord. Like there's never that line of argument, that mighty argument. And David pursues his sin, but when he repents, this hubris, God gives him three choices for, for his punishment. Uh, so Gad came to David and told him and said to him, Shall seven years of famine come to you in your land? Or will you flee three months before your foes will, while they pursue you? Or shall there be three days pestilence in your land? Now consider and see what answer I shall return to him who sent me. And David chooses the three days of pestilence. And actually he says, I am in great distress. Let us now fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great, but do not let me fall into the hand of man. So this was David's sin. 
but he's not willing to take the consequence just on himself. Only one of these actually was a consequence that was actually going to primarily just affect David, and that was if he decided to flee for three months from the hand of his enemy. What's interesting is there's a, it's a very defined timeline. God says it'll only be three months, therefore indicating that you will be restored after that punishment's over. But David chooses the three days of pestilence. And uh, it says that in those three days, 70,000 men of the people from Band of Beersheba died. The consequence of David's sin, a sin, a sin which Joab was consulted in and did not persuade him against, not effectively anyway, uh, therefore enabled his sin, resulted in the death of 70,000. And the final, uh, final act of betrayal on, on Joab's part is 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 5 through 7. See, now Adonijah, the son of Haggath, Haggath, exalted him, saying, I will be king. So he prepared for himself chariots and horsemen with fifty men to run before him. His father had never crossed him at any time by asking, Why have you done so? He was also a very handsome man, and he was born after Absalom. He had conferred with Joab, the son of Zeruiah, and with Abiathar, the priest, and following Adonijah, they helped him. So we see that one of David's older sons at this point, that's still alive, Adonijah, is essentially plotting a coup. David's still alive, he's still on the throne. Uh, he, hasn't, he has told Bathsheba that Solomon will be the king, but that wasn't a public pronouncement. Nobody knew that the, the line of succession was going to go to, to Solomon at this point. So Adonijah, seeing his father as perhaps weak and feckless, uh, goes to Joab. Again, evidence that man was not a great influence in, in uh, David's family. And, and ask for help, saying, hey, will you put me on the throne? It says, Joab participates in this. He followed behind. They helped him. So Adonijah goes ahead and, and gets himself exalted up on the throne. All the people are, are cheering that it's for him. Uh, well, Nathan the prophet and, and some others. Um, and Zadok the priest, Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, and Nathan the prophet, all came to him. They were still faithful to David. Uh, despite what they saw going on, and, and David being on, actually we see in the beginning of the chapter that David's doesn't say on his deathbed, but he's not doing well, and he's, they, they have somebody basically hand-feeding him. Um, so he was in a weak state at this point, but they go and advise him, saying, hey, I, I don't think this is what you want. Adonijah's not the guy to replace you. Haven't you said that Solomon will be the one? David confirms yes, and he brings him back Bathsheba and says, I promise to you that your son Solomon will be king after me. So Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada, they all go about and, and get Solomon on the throne. And Adonijah, uh, for fear of his life, uh, goes ahead and, and puts himself in the horn of the altars and begs for mercy on Solomon's side. Um, so Solomon's instated as king. Adonijah renounces his claim to the, the throne, at least initially. Then David has this conversation before his death, his son Solomon. He says, Now you also know that Joab, the son of what Joab, the son of Zeruiah, did to me, that he did to the two commanders, the armies of Israel, to Abner, the son of Ner, and to Amasa, the son of Jether, whom he killed. He also shed the blood of war in peace, and he put the blood of war on his belt, about his waist, and on his sandals, on his feet. So act according to your wisdom, and do not let his gray hair go down to Sheol in peace. So we see here, David knew all along the man that Joab was. And in fact, that, that first story he talks about, Abner, the son of Ner, that was very early in David's rule. David, I think the estimate was about 30, 32, when he was the, initially became king. Uh, he ruled for about 40 years, so he was in his 70s at this point. Um, and he knew that entire time, because that was year one that he killed Abner, entire time that Joab was this terrible murderer. A violent man who made terrible decisions, did not give good advice, um, and maybe was very, very competent as a general in, in winning wars and winning battles, um, but was not a good man. Not a good man to keep around his family. Not a good man to be propped up as a leader within Israel. Um, but yet he tolerated him. He tolerated Joab and his sin. But we see here the evidence that David knew. David knew all along. Just the man, the kind of man that Joab was. So we don't necessarily know why David tolerated it. We're never given that, that explicit insight. Um, perhaps it's that David kept him around because he was family, 
Maybe he did actually love him despite his, his many flaws that were like, obvious to all. It's even possible that David kept him around because sometimes leaders think it's convenient to keep a man around who's willing to get his hands dirty. We don't know. It is possible. But what we do know is that almost every single event in David's life that we just reviewed, Joab had, had part in. And all these events were like the banner events for, for terrible things that happened to David or that David caused or that happened to the kingdom because of David's decisions. And Joab was around for every single one of them. You know, the, the results here are pretty obvious. He murdered Abner, Uriah, and Amasa. He murdered David's son, Absalom. Uh, he carried out an order that he knew to be against God's will. And 70,000 people died. He enabled another son to, to commit a coup against David. And all the while, and I think this is the most tragic part, is that David's children and his family were exposed to the sinful man who were likely strongly influenced by that poor example. This is the kind of company that, that David kept. And it's what's sad is we see, so their, their interests were not aligned. I mean, they were on a, on a physical plane. Like they, they were both trying to keep Israel strong. So their interests are aligned in that regard. But in the important thing, the most important thing, and that's serving God, this is not a mutually supportive relationship. Joab enabled David to sin many times. He committed many sins that, that were of great consequence to David and, and caused him a lot of grief. Um, and Joab's concern was not about making sure that David was a, a godly ruler. Joab's concerns were making sure that David was a strong man ruler, in a very physical sense, that he was the king that the Israelites were looking for when they wanted a king to be established. Uh, what they thought they were getting from Saul, which turned out to not be, that's the kind of king that they were trying to, that Joab was trying to make sure David was. David was, as we know, the Bible says, and, and we can trust it, that he was a man after God's own heart. And he did repent many times after all the, these issues. You see that. David had a heart that was, uh, while he made mistakes, he was still a good man, and, and God called him that. Um, so I'm not trying to, to say that David was an evil king. I'm just saying that it's obvious that in all his troubles, there's a common denominator, and that was a man that he tolerated to be around him. So, when we look at Matthew chapter 10, verse 32 to 35, it says, Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father, and a daughter against his mother, and a daughter against, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be the members of his household. He who loves his father more or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And I think it's important to note that what Christ meant here is that not that we should hate our family relations, but rather that our love for Christ must be so much more. And I think sometimes it's important to remember that, that not all of us, I mean, I know there are some in the room who are very fortunate to have all their family members, or at least the majority of them, that are also believers. That's not the case for most Christians, I don't think. Um, and while we have those relationships, and I'm not saying anybody should shun their family, you're saying it's important to remember the, the order of, of importance that God wants us to place on our relationships, and that we shouldn't tolerate people in our lives, whether they're family or not, who are dragging us down and not allowing us to be aligned with God's will not enabling us or strengthening us or encouraging us to do what God expects of us. The company we keep must be the church, God's others, other believers. Ephesians 4, verse 3 through 4 says, Be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you also were called in one hope. 1 Peter 2, 5, You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. The Bible talks in many places about how the, the believers in the local church are being built together, that we are one body, and that we must work together, and we must love each other. We must be willing to make sacrifices for each other, and that those relationships are very important. Wow, the Bible is clear on this point. Uh, now, I know most of that is so small, you probably can't read it back there. I'm having trouble reading it on the screen right in front of me. Uh, but this... These are 30 specific commandments from throughout the New Testament that I call the one another command. 
they and I've got all the scriptures there and, and I can if you're interested you can I can get you these scriptures later um, but when you read and some of them most of these depending on the version of or translation that you're going through are commandments for what brethren must do for one another so for example in John 13 34 to 35 it says love one another Next one, bear one another's burdens, care for one another, comfort one another, be compassionate towards one another, consider one another, have fellowship with one another, be kind to one another, be affectionate to one another, prefer one another, exhort one another, minister to one another, provoke to love and good works, teach one another, show hospitality to one another, be humble, showing tolerance towards one another, be like-minded, serve one another, be subject to one another, submit to one another, receive and accept one another, greet one another, Speak to one another, confess your faults to one another, forbear with one another, forgive one another, pray with, for and with one another, carry with one another, admonish one another, and edify one another. And there's actually like seven or eight more that are on the do not do to each other list for, for what Christians are not supposed to do to other, other Christians. Um, I didn't bring those up. But my point in this is you see the relationship that David and Joab had. That was a terrible relationship, and it was not mutually... Uh, reinforcing they were not supporting each other being more spiritual and all of David's grief could stem from that but what we have what we can what we are offered in the local church are all these wonderful things that we can do for one another and that we're expected to do for one another and those are the relationships we should treasure value this was the bottom left one be devoted to one another and brotherly love giving preference to one another in honor not lagging behind in diligence fervent in spirit serving the Lord Rejoicing in hope, preserving in, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Friendships that we can build within the Lord's Church are incredibly special. They're unlike anything you're, you're likely to find anywhere else in the world. Some of us might have, have some really good friends outside the church that are not dragging us down. We might not be Christians, uh, but that we can maintain good bonds of, with people that are not Christians not trying to say that we should not be friends with people in the world. In fact, I think the Bible speaks against that and says we shouldn't be like monks, cloistered away from the world, not being able, because then how, how are we ever going to be able to influence people to also join us here in the pews and get baptized and, and add themselves to Christ's kingdom? I'm not saying don't be friends with people in the world. I am saying be selective about the people that you tolerate in your life when they are not a good influence on you or on your family, or if they are detracting from your ability to live a spiritual life. Those are the, the pearls before swine type argument. We can't continue to give ourselves and, and allow ourselves to have relationships with people that pull us away from God rather than push us toward Him. And I think the, the best place you will find meaningful relationships in this world that will help push you towards God are the other people in this room and in other people, other rooms, but people just like this all around the world that are today, on the first day of the week, worshiping the Lord. Those are the, the relationships that Romans 12 is telling us to give preference to one another. We should prefer the company of other, other Christians. The Lord gave us this local church as an instrument for a friend. He's great wisdom. We need to take advantage of that tremendous gift. We need to work towards building those relationships with each other and treasuring those above all other types of relationships. Now, there's a lot of other types of relationships that other sermons can be given on that, that will help build up the local church. I mean, you can talk about marriage relationship, talk about the relationship between the parents and their children. Uh, but, but today I was just talking about those friendships, those common bonds that we should have and that we should strive to have with other Christians and that we should protect ourselves from with those who are not like-minded. I hope that was encouraging to you this morning. I have not been talking about specifically what, what is expected of us in, in becoming Christians and how you can join in and get the benefits, these many benefits that we saw in this, about how we can become more spiritually minded and how we can encourage one another. Uh, but to have access to that, there's a starting point. To hear the word of Christ, you have to believe it, to confess that Christ is your Lord and Savior. You have to be willing to get baptized to be added to the Lord's church. And I hope that if there are any of you who who are on that path that you would let us know uh, that we might pray for you and might help you along if you feel that you are ready for the waters of baptism then we have a baptistry available and we are we are willing and able and we'd be more than happy in fact we'd be overjoyed to, to add you to our number so if there are any who have that need this morning please come forward to this morning.